tonight we put on a, um, a program. We partnered with Neil Baldwin and the Creative Research Center. And Professor John Cornius of Drexel released a book today uh, called The Eureka Factor. So he is speaking on the very day that his book is released. I teach a course called The Entrepreneurial Imagination. It's ENTR 290. It meets Tuesdays and Thursdays in the fall from 10 to 11, 15 in the morning. And we still have a few spots available for any of you guys who are interested. I can tell you right now that one of the textbooks is going to be John's book for sure. Um, today is the publication date of the Eureka Factor. Today is the very day. And in the back there, we have our very good friends from Watchung Booksellers who are waiting to sell you a book that John will sign right after he finishes speaking. So please head back there after the talk and get to meet John and have him sign your book. I'm going to just read an excerpt from a very brief email that John sent me in December. I didn't tell him I was going to read this, but um, instead of going through all of his, his incredible qualifications and his blurbs and all the great things that people have said about him, I think this sums it up pretty well. So we had to really work hard to get John on the calendar because we wanted it to coincide with the pub date of the book. So this goes back to December, right before Christmas. He writes this. Hi, Neil. One request. Please treat the book as if it were a murder mystery and not distribute spoilers in blog posts, talks, and etc. These days, once a cool anecdote hits cyberspace, it can go viral very quickly. I don't want any of the material in the book to be stale by the time the book is published. So I kept my promise. That was like four months ago, and it's all happening right now. Uh, just two things that have happened recently which I think are important. Business Insider named The Eureka Factor one of the 15 best business books of the year, which I think is a great accomplishment. And the second is a quote from a professor at the Wharton School named Adam Grant, who said that this is a vigorous voyage inside the mind to understand those electrifying, elusive moments of discovery and how we can have them more often. What is an insight? John and his co-author Mark Beeman set out to answer this question. Along the way, he talks about successful entrepreneurs and how they handle new ideas. And even more importantly, how they know when the idea is there and how they manage the gestation and refinement and implementation of the idea. He does this in a very step-by-step -step way that is never boring, takes us into the cognitive world of idea generation, into the brain as well as into the mind. He shows us how to get into the right mental position to have good ideas. He shows us how to think outside the box once we know what the box is. He shows us how to make the right amount of withdrawal from the bank of experience. He walks us through the continuum between thinking and sudden realization. And by the way, he has a music background, which maybe is why he shows us how to pay attention to the pauses between the notes where things happen, not just the notes themselves. And one final heads up, at the end of the talk, John told me he will share some of the insights he's having now into his current research in the field of neuromarketing. So let's give a big round of applause to John Cunios. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Neil in particular for his fantastic organizational work, uh, amazing attention to detail and enthusiasm. I want to thank the Creative Research Center and the Feliciana Center for, for hosting me, and I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, this, this event is important to me. It's my first book, and this is the publication date of my first book, so this is kind of an emotional thing for me, too. And thank you for being here. Okay, so we're going to talk about creativity and insight uh, in the brain and in the mind, but first we're going to start with a little astronomy lesson. Okay. If I can get this to work. Here we go. All right. Galaxies come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. There's the traditional spiral galaxy you see in the upper left-hand corner, but there are other kinds. There are elliptical and, and spherical galaxies. Um, 60 years ago, which is not all that long ago, 
no one knew what the shape of our galaxy, the Milky Way, is. Hard to imagine, but just 60 years ago, nobody knew. And the problem is analogous to uh, the problem that people had hundreds of years ago when they didn't know what the shape of the Earth was, whether it was round or flat. The problem was because people at that time could not get away from the Earth, turn around and look at it and see what its shape was. Similarly, 60 years ago, as today, we can't get outside the galaxy and turn around and look at it, so it's very complicated to figure out what the shape of the Milky Way is. Well, that interested, that question really interested the great astronomer William Wilson Morgan uh, one day in 1951. Uh, that was a question that interested him, but wasn't what he was working on one particular night. What he was working on that night was what is called OB associations. OB associations are young, hot, bright stars. Uh, you could think of them as star nurseries, where stars are born. In spiral galaxies, these OB associations are in the spiral arms of the galaxy, but in other types of galaxies, they're in different parts. And Morgan knew that. But what he was doing one night was calculating the distances of these OB association stars. He was figuring out how far away they were. And he was working one night at the Yerkes Observatory, and he had computed a number of the distances of a number of these stars. And he quit for the night, and he started to walk home, and it was a beautiful, clear night, and he looked up at the sky. And he saw some of the stars whose distances he had been calculating, these OB association stars. And he knew how far away they were. But of course, when you look at the night sky, what you see is a flat, two-dimensional image. You can't really see the depth, how far these stars are away. I mean, the moon looks the same distance as anything else. It just looks bigger. Uh, but then, in one instant, he had what he later called a flash inspiration, a creative intuitional burst. What happened in an instant was that he looked at that flat two-dimensional image of the stars in the sky, and it clicked, it merged with the distances of the stars that he had memorized, that he knew. And when he looked at that pattern and could see, it was sort of like seeing a painting, a flat painting, come alive as a three-dimensional image. And when he looked at these OB associations, he realized that they, that they were on a long strand which was part of a spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy. In that instant, he directly apprehended the shape of the Milky Way galaxy and realized that it was a, a, a spiral galaxy. Uh, he later went on to collect data to verify his perception, and he presented it at a conference to thunderous applause of his colleagues. He was the one who discovered that our galaxy is a spiral, a tremendous accomplishment. And it happened as a sudden insight, uh, this, this connection between ideas that happens in an instant. So it's fair to ask what's going on in anyone's mind, whether it's uh, a galactic insight or an everyday insight. What's going on in a person's mind when they have that kind of real, sudden realization? And uh, a hundred years ago, uh, the Gestalt psychologists of Germany started to investigate this kind of question, but they came at it from a very interesting perspective. They were interested, around the time of World War I, these German psychologists were interested in visual perception. They were interested in how you look at objects and your mind analyzes the parts but puts them together into a whole and how we tend to see that whole. In fact, their motto was that the sum is, is the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So when you look at an object like this cube, it's called a Necker cube, uh, you can take those parts and you can put them together mentally in different ways. So you can see that cube. In fact, almost everybody tends to see it as three-dimensional rather than flat. Uh, you could see it like this, where the square in the upper right-hand corner is closer to you. Or you could see it like this, where the square in the lower uh, left-hand corner is closer to you. 
you can take those same parts and rearrange them mentally to form a somewhat different object. Uh, and when you do this, that shift of attention, it happens in an instant. You see it one way, or you flip your attention and you see it another way. You can't see it in both ways at the same time because these two different interpretations are incompatible with each other. So they were very interested, the Gestalt psychologists, in applying this idea of reinterpretation to other areas of cognition. In particular, they were interested in problem solving. How is it that you can look at a problem and be completely stumped, and then all of a sudden you have this aha moment, this sudden insight, where you see it in a new light. You see it from a different perspective. And you had been interpreting it, the situation incorrectly. And now that you interpret it in a different way, it can all seem crystal clear, totally obvious what the solution is. So they use this phenomenon of visual perception to understand an important aspect of problem solving. Okay. Well, let's go back a few hundred years to Christopher Columbus. Um, the Gestalt psychologists developed puzzles that they used to study Gestalt uh, to study problem solving and sudden insight. And one of the most famous of them has its, its roots in Christopher Columbus, although he didn't know that at the time. Uh, there's a story told about Columbus. It may, it may be apocryphal uh, that he was at a dinner party uh, with Spanish nobles. And they wanted to hobnob with the great man and hear stories and bask in his reflected glory. But one of the Spanish noblemen was not so impressed. He said to Columbus, you know, you made this great discovery, but anybody could have done that if they had the same resources you did. I don't see what, why what you did was so creative or fantastic. And when, that, when he made that statement, Columbus simply asked for an egg. And they brought him an egg. Presumably it was a hard-boiled egg, as you'll see why. He asked them if any of them could make the egg stand on its end. And of course, they all tried and were flustered. None of them could do it. And then Columbus took the egg, and he did the following. He cracked the end of it, we assume it was hard-boiled, and made it stand up. And then they realized an important thing, and that is sometimes something seems obvious in hindsight, but it was totally obscure in foresight. It's only afterwards that it seems obvious, but it takes creativity to see that thing in foresight that later becomes obvious in hindsight. And if you zoom in here, instead of an aha moment, this guy in back of him, we call that an a uh, duh moment. Okay. So, over time, that legend got somehow associated with a puzzle uh, called the Christopher Columbus Egg Puzzle. This was in a book published about 100 years ago. I don't know what this has to do with Christopher Columbus, except that it has eggs. And you see these nine eggs there. Okay. Um, and then over time, the Gestalt psychologists adopted uh, or transformed this puzzle into what's become the, the most famous of what's called the classic insight problems. You see, the Gestalt psychologists developed a number of these puzzles or problems that when people are able to solve them, which is rare, they usually do it with a flash of insight, an aha moment. It's very difficult to, to, to solve these kinds of puzzles in a, in a deliberate, analytical fashion. So it became what's called the nine-dot problem. And some of you may be familiar with this from taking a psychology course, undergraduate psychology course. What you do is you take a pencil and you connect all the dots draw with four lines never lifting the pencil from the paper. Four straight lines to connect all the dots. Uh, in many experiments that have been done, on, mostly on college undergraduates, about 0% of them can solve it within 10 minutes. If you're familiar with the answer, of course, it's easy. But I'm not going to torture you with it. I'll just show you. There's more than one solution. And this is the most famous solution. The reason that this is so incredibly difficult for people to solve is that they make assumptions that are not warranted. 
when you look at the nine dots, you tend to see it as a square, as a single object against this blank background. And you assume that the background is irrelevant to the problem. So it's sort of like you're reading a book, you pay attention to the text, and you ignore the margins. The margins are irrelevant. You don't think about the margins when you're reading a book. So when you're doing this problem, you think that the background is irrelevant. So you, it doesn't occur to you that the pencil lines can extend beyond the boundary of the square. But it takes what's literally thinking outside the box to solve the problem. And that's the origin of that familiar phrase, is this nine dot problem. You have to get rid of the unnecessary, unwritten assumption that you're not allowed to exceed the boundaries of the box. There's actually at least one other solution to this problem, which I personally find kind of mind-bending. Um, there is a way to connect all these dots using just three lines. And uh, until I found this solution, someone showed it to me, I couldn't believe my eyes. It goes like this. You have to assume that, uh, you have to understand that these are dots, not points. If you interpret these as points, you can't do this. But if you interpret them as dots, you can. And that takes even yet a further uh, loosening of the unnecessary restrictions on one's thinking. So the Gestalt psychologists developed a lot of these kinds of puzzles, and they posed them to people and, uh, to, in order to study how people have sudden insights. When people solve this problem, which is rare, it's usually with a, an aha, a flash of insights, like, oh yeah, now I see how that happens. And even when you show them the solution afterwards, sometimes people have that feeling of sudden insight. So insight, an aha moment, is this sudden reorganization or reinterpretation of a situation in such a way that everything looks different and the solution or a new idea can seem obvious. It wasn't obvious beforehand, but after this reorganization of thought, it, it is obvious. And we were interested in finding out what's happening in the brain when a person actually has one of these aha moments. Because there were some cognitive psychologists, still one or two still around, who deny the importance or existence of insight or aha moments. They argue that insight is just regular, deliberate, analytical thought, but with a little emotional flourish at the end to give it impact. Uh, so we were interested in sort of seeing, is there something in the brain that's actually different when you solve a problem or you have an idea with an aha moment compared to analytical thought, which is this deliberate, methodical, conscious thought. So we decided, Mark Beeman and I, my, my colleague who's now at Northwestern University, uh, we decided to use neuroimaging to study what happens in a brain when a person has one of these aha moments. And we used two different techniques. One is EEG, or electroencephalography, which is my particular specialty. And Mark's specialty is fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging. The reason we use these two techniques is that fMRI is really good at telling you exactly where in the brain something's happening, but it's not really good at telling you exactly when something's happening. So it's sort of, in the time domain, it's a little blurry, but spatially, it's really good. EEG, which is what I use, is very precise in time. It tells you exactly when a brain event is happening down to a few milliseconds, but it's fuzzy in terms of telling you exactly where in the brain something's happening. So by using both these techniques, we're able to localize an aha moment in the brain in both time, when it happens, and in space, what part of the brain it's happening in. And we needed to come up with a way to induce these aha moments or insights. We couldn't give people these classic insight problems because almost nobody can solve them within a few minutes. And to do neuroimaging, you need lots and lots of uh, problems and lots and lots of aha moments. And you can't get that with the nine dot problem. So we use little verbal puzzles that are called remote associates problems. And we gave people dozens and dozens of these things. And the way it works is you get three words. Each puzzle is three words. In this case, hot, catcher, food. You have to think of a fourth word which can form a compound or a familiar phrase with each of those three words. 
and I'm, I'm not going to torture you by asking you to think of what it is, but I'll just tell you it's dog. Hot dog, dog food, dog catcher. Okay. People can solve about half of these in a given session, and about half of those, on average, they solve with a flash of insight, an aha moment. Just, the solution just pops into awareness. The other half of the time, they solve them analytically. Uh, so they, they, they might look at the word hot and say, what goes with hot? Cold. Does cold go with food? Yes. Does cold go with catcher? No. What else goes with hot? They go through this trial and error process until they eventually hit on the solution. So we had some solutions with insight, some solutions that are analytical, and we can compare the brain activity for these two types of solutions. And the main finding is here. Uh, time goes from left to right on this, on this graph. And where the R is in that yellow, yellow arrow is the moment at which they press a button to indicate that they have the solution to the problem. And we have on the y-axis, the, the vertical axis, we have a measure of EEG activity, brain electrical activity. And we have solutions, some of which were through insight and some of which were analytic. And you can see just about 300 milliseconds before they push that button, there's a burst of brain activity when they have an insight that's not there when they solve it analytically. And that 300 milliseconds, is that's how long it takes them to actually push the button. So what we're talking about is right at the moment when the idea pops into awareness as an insight, there's this burst of high frequency brain electrical activity. So we had found sort of a neural signature of an aha moment. And we wanted to find out where it was in the brain. In, with an EEG, if you look at the right side of the head here, each little red dot is the location of an electrode. And that sort of yellow-orange hot spot, that is the difference between inside and analytical solutions. It's right above the right ear. It's in the right temporal lobe of the brain. And with fMRI, we could localize it exactly to an area called the right anterior superior temporal gyrus. You don't have to know that name. I'm not going to test you on that. But that's just to show you that there is a specific area of the brain that, where you find this response. Interestingly, people who have damage to that brain area due to accident or stroke or disease tend to have problems in understanding jokes and metaphors. Uh, it, it's, this is a brain area that seems to process, to be intimately involved in processing uh, remote associations, uh, connections between ideas that are not obvious, that are kind of distant. And that, that's obviously why it's important to insight as well as to jokes and metaphors. Okay, so we had found a neural signature of insight. We were convinced that, in fact, insight is different from analytical thought. Uh, but there was another finding here that we were rather surprised at. And that is, just before this burst of high-frequency EEG activity, okay, the gamma here, uh, that's the high-frequency EEG activity corresponding to the insight. Just before that was a burst of slower EEG wave, brain waves called alpha waves that are focused in the back of the head. So you have this burst of alpha waves in the back of the head, and then about a second later, a burst of high-frequency EEG in the right temporal lobe, sort of that one-two punch. What we know about alpha waves is that it, it reflects an area of the brain actually shutting down. And the back of the brain here is visual cortex. Interestingly, infer your brain doesn't uh, process visual information near the eyes. That information from your eyes goes to the back of your brain. Go figure that. That's visual cortex in the back of the head. So what this alpha blink, we call it a brain blink, is, is that for an instant, your brain is taking in less visual information. And then it has the insight. So here's a way to think about it. If you ever corral somebody and you ask them a really difficult question, what you'll often notice is they, they look away. They might look down or up. They might close their eyes. Faces are very distracting. And in order to, to concentrate, to find weakly activated thoughts, people often shut out the, the, the world around them. 
they often close their eyes or look away. I like to look at the, a blank ceiling or something like that when I'm trying to figure something out. In our experiments, people couldn't do that. They couldn't close their eyes or look away. But their brains did it for them. Uh, the idea is that the brain, for an instant, reduces distracting inputs, and that increases the signal-to-noise ratio. It allows this weakly activated solution to bubble up into consciousness, and that is that burst of activity in the right temporal lobe. Okay. That was a surprising finding, but it, it clued us in into a strategy how to proceed. And that strategy is insights, when you have them, they pop into, into consciousness seemingly from nowhere. They don't seem to have any precursors often. But there are a series of brain events, unconscious, that lead up to that conscious insight. And we thought, you know, these, these unconscious brain events, those, in principle, we might be able to influence those to either increase or decrease the likelihood of having an insight. So we started looking into what are some of the factors that can increase or decrease the likelihood of having an insight by looking at these precursors. One of them was in a subsequent study we did. This is Louis Pasteur, the great biomedical researcher, who famously said, chance favors only the prepared mind. And in, in the original French, in a speech he gave, it's a little ambiguous exactly what he meant by that. But the interpretation that we like, obviously, is that you're more likely to have an insight if, you're, if you have a particular mindset, a particular frame of mind that makes you receptive to, to a new idea. So in a follow-up study, what we did was we looked at brain activity just before each of these verbal puzzles was, excuse me, each of these verbal puzzles was presented. So you're looking at a blank screen, you're waiting for the puzzle, we're measuring your brain activity, and then the puzzle shows up. So we looked at brain activity before each puzzle for puzzles that you would solve with an aha compared to puzzles you would eventually solve analytically. And what we found is that there's several brain areas that when they are active before the puzzle show, uh, turn, uh, is displayed on the screen, it inclines you to solve that problem with a flash of insight. And one of the main ones is this area called the anterior cingulate. It's right in the middle of the front of the head. Um, and that brain area does a lot of interesting things. One thing that has been well studied in the last 10 to 15 years is that the anterior cingulate monitors the rest of the brain for what's called cognitive conflicts, signals that are incompatible with each other. In the original research, it was something as simple as you can't press a button on the left and a button on the right at the same time. They're incompatible. You can't do it simultaneously. But what we propose is that the interior cingulate lights up for all different kinds of, of incompatible responses, or in this case, incompatible solutions to a problem. You could try to solve a problem one way, or you could try to solve it another way. Those are incompatible. You can't do both at the same time. Certain types of solutions are obvious, okay? So for example, you have a jar of, of spaghetti sauce. You can't open it. Well, what's the obvious thing to do? Try harder, okay? That's really obvious. There are non-obvious kinds of solutions. Perhaps a non-obvious one might be something like get a can opener, pretend it's a can, and cut the top off, okay? Who thinks of that, right? It's not obvious. When the interior cingulate is active, it opens your mind, it allows your mind to detect all of these weak, long shot ideas. These things that don't seem likely or usable at, at first, but if you think about them more, they might be. When the interior cingulate is not active, then your mind is dominated by the obvious, what's straight in front of you, sort of the single dominant interpretation. So that's why when your interior cingulate is active, you're open to insights, to alternative possibilities. You can restructure your thought in such a way that these alternate ideas can bubble up to the surface. 
So that leads to the question, how do you make your interior cingulate light up? How do you open your mind to all the possibilities of a situation instead of just having blinders on and just seeing what's obvious, what's dominant all the time? Well, one way to do that, it's been known for a number of years, is, create, is mood. A positive mood improves creativity. A negative mood, particularly anxiety, increases analytical thought. If you have, if you have to do analytical work, deliberate, methodical work where you know how to do it, a little anxiety is okay. But when you need to come up with something really novel and unusual and look at things in a different way, a positive mood seems to facilitate that. So we did a follow-up experiment where we actually measured people's moods with a questionnaire when they came in the off the street and then put them through this neuroimaging experiment. And we looked at all the brain areas that were influenced by mood, whether people who were in a positive mood or negative mood. And we looked at all of the brain areas that were involved in either preparation to solve a problem with insight or preparation to solve it analytically. And these two lists had one thing in common. That's the interior cingulate. Okay? The interior cingulate, a positive mood, when you're in a good mood, it boosts activity in the interior cingulate, and it literally opens your mind to alternative possibilities. But when you're anxious or in a negative mood, the interior cingulate starts decreasing activity, and it's like putting mental blinders on you, so that your mind is dominated by one or two obvious possibilities, and all of the long shots, the crazy ideas, get squashed. So that's one way to influence insight. Another way has to do with attention. So look at these two figures. We have a square made of triangles, and we have a triangle made of squares. I'm going to ask you a question, and there's no wrong or right answer to this. Which of these two figures looks more like this one? Okay. Some people say that the square made of triangles looks more like the square made of squares. And other people say that the triangle made of squares looks more like the square made of squares. It depends on whether you're looking at the forest or the trees. If you're looking at the forest, if your attention is spread out to take in the whole, then you will think that the square made of triangles looks more like the square made of squares. If you're focused on details, the parts, then you'll tend to think that the triangle made of squares looks more like the square made of squares. So many studies have shown that this broadening of attention also involves broadening of thought. Okay. Um, so, along those lines, if you, if you spend time in big open spaces, that broadens attention. If you're outdoors, you're in a large room, if you're in a room with high ceilings, all of those have been shown to broaden attention and that broadens thought to allow in these sort of non-obvious ideas. But if you spend time in small, cramped spaces where your attention can't expand, you tend to think in a deliberate analytical fashion. Also, if you have around you objects that are very striking that grab your attention and focus it, that too constricts your thinking to sort of the obvious and dominant. It puts blinders. It gives you tunnel vision. I mean, something as simple as having a letter opener sitting on a desk grabs attention because a letter opener is, in a subtle way, unconsciously or consciously threatening. It grabs your attention. It narrows it. And it similarly narrows thought. So to increase creativity, you have to broaden attention. That involves big open spaces and not having objects around that are striking that grab your attention and narrow it. Okay. Give you one more thing, and that is sleep. Um, 
Sleep is not well understood, but one of the things that we do understand about it is that it, it's intimately involved in memory. There's a process called memory consolidation. When you form, when you acquire new information during the day, it's initially stored in a temporary form in your brain. And then while you sleep, that information is consolidated. One analogy is that of cement. When you pour cement, it's wet and soft. You can deform it, you can deface it. Once it's, it hardens and dries and hardens, it's strong. It's not so easy to mess up. Memories are similar. When you sleep, memories are transformed in, from a, uh, a soft, weak, fragile state into a harder, more durable state. They're also easier to retrieve. But memory does something else as well, which is the, the, the cement analogy kind of breaks down. So let's say there's, uh, uh, you, you read the following sentences. Tom is taller than Bill. Bill is taller than Jack. Jack is taller than Phil. Phil is taller than Steve. Then you take a nap. Okay? Well, um, that nap will improve your memory for those sentences, but it will do something else as well. And what it does is it brings out the hidden relationships. There was no sentence there that said, Tom is taller than Steve. But it's implied. It's buried in that information. What sleep does is it brings out, it transforms memories to bring out these implicit, hidden, non-obvious details. That's one of the reasons that sleep is a tremendous way to boost creativity. And in fact, there are many stories, famous stories, of uh, people who have great ideas. They're, they could either be awakened by these ideas in the middle of the night because they have them in a dream, or they have them as soon as they wake up in the morning or shortly thereafter before their brain enters a fully awake state. In fact, there's a, a story of Paul McCartney that um, he woke up one morning with this melody in his head. And at first he thought, well, it sounds like a good tune. Probably I heard it somewhere. So he asked John Lennon, he asked a bunch of musicians, none of them had ever heard it before. So he figured, well, you know, I must, have, I must have come up with this idea, but it just came to him whole. Not the words, the words he added later, but it was just the tune. And that was the, the, the song yesterday. It came to him, as he later described, as a whole, and he just wrote it down. Okay? And that's the kind of thing that sleep does. And in fact, uh, something like that happened in my laboratory. Um, I have this uh, a grad student of mine at the time, Jason Van Steenberg. Now he's a postdoc at Johns Hopkins University. And he was doing an EEG experiment in my lab. It was unrelated to creativity. It was on something else. So he had tested many, many subjects, something like 36 subjects. And after each testing session, he checked the data. And he did that for the first seven subjects, and they all looked good. So he stopped checking the data. He was just testing people. After he collected 36 subjects, it took him months to do this, because it's not easy. After the 36 subjects, he started analyzing the data. And he was horrified to find that, yeah, those first seven people he tested, the data looked great. But all the remaining ones looked like garbage. The noise, it just looked like scratchy noise. And he couldn't figure this out. So he checked the hardware. The EG machine worked fine. He checked the computers, they were fine. The software was fine. He checked everything, he couldn't find what was wrong. And he was just distraught because he had spent months doing this. And he, um, he had just about resigned himself to having to redo the whole experiment. And then one night, he had a dream. And in the dream, his little daughter, Sasha, who's two years old, appeared to him and said, Daddy, it's the PPM files. OK? Um, so there's Sasha right there. Um, and then he realized what each EEG file on the computer has an associated PPM file that has certain parameters that you use to analyze the EEG data. And he had gotten the PPM files mixed up. And once he associated each data file with the correct PPM file, it was all fine. It, it, all the data was fine. He was able to reconstruct the whole thing. The experiment was fine. So it was that dream, his, his daughter, two-year-old daughter, appearing to him in a dream, telling him how to solve the problem 
that was, you know, it, it just saved him months and months of effort. Um, another example uh, hit a little closer to home. Uh, we had finished writing the book, and uh, we were trying to come up with a title. And every single title idea we came up with, our editor just, he not only rejected them, he just turned up his nose at all of them. He just scoffed at every idea we had for a title. And we were getting kind of desperate because, uh, you know, the book was done. The book was going to be published, and we didn't have a title. So um, one night I went to bed, but my wife fell asleep on the couch in the family room. And then about 1 in the morning, she woke up, and she came, and she woke me up, and she said, I woke up with the idea for the title in my mind. I know what it is. And I said, well, what, what's the title? And she said, it's The Eureka Factor. And I said, oh, that sounds great. Now I'm going back to sleep. Okay. <laughs> so the next morning, I emailed my co-author. I emailed the, emailed the editor. They both loved it. I loved it, too. And that became the title. And I mean, my wife's dream kind of saved it, because we would have had to delay the publication of the book simply not because we didn't have a title that the editor was happy with. So um, there are various ways to improve your creativity, which touched on just three of them here, uh, but there are many others. And uh, you can use this kind of information to create your own mental state conducive to creativity. So go out there, have ideas, improve your life, and improve the world, and be creative. Thank you.